Welcome to the Land Geek Podcast, your resource for information and tips to making money by buying and selling land. Let the Land Geek show you how to make a passive income by working smart, not working hard. Learn strategies and tricks to make money buying and selling raw land today. And here is the man that's going to help you do that, the Land Geek. Hey, it's Mark Podolsky, the Land Geek, with your favorite real estate niche land website for all things real estate investing, as far as land is concerned, www.thelandgeek.com. And today, our regular guest, is he even a guest anymore? He's the man, the myth, living off the beach in Carlsbad, California. He needs no introduction, but I'm going to introduce him anyway, from reserveland.com and landhub.com and 18 other domains. Duran Frazier! Duran, what's going on, buddy? How are you, my friend? Pulse is normal. Respiration's fine. I can't complain. I've had three cups of coffee this morning. I'm wired, and my ADD is kicking in. But I'm so happy to be on this uh, podcast with you on this fine day. That's awesome. You know, I, I uh, like you, I'm on my third cup, but I'm actually drinking tea with honey so that I can get my voice back. Very, I've been yeah. I've been a little concerned that I you know people tell me I talk too much well <laughs> my wife my, my wife primarily sure and so you know and those who listen to the podcast can probably assume that as well so when I when I'm talking a lot I don't really like a like a singer would protect their voice I don't do a really good job of supporting my voice and um, so I have to actually go get a voice this and this I got to get a voice coach to learn how to talk and then I have to probably go on vocal rest for a few days. That's pathetic. Yeah, that's a real first world problem that you have to go out and hire a vocal coach so that you can talk even more than you're talking. Maybe if I talk slower like this, it would be better for me. You think so? I can see how you're enunciating better when you're talking more slowly, but people are going to click off the podcast if we continue talking like this. <laughs> <laughs> So tell me anything new uh, in the world of land for you, Mark, this week. Yeah, all right. So I got a great deal. I'll tell you about it. I found a bulk seller. She had five lots, and these lots all owed two to three thousand dollars in back taxes. So I'm spending about fifteen grand just to pay off her back taxes. They comp each the five lots each comp at forty grand. So I'm going to spend $15,000. I'm probably going to make about $150,000, $200,000. It's a great realtor deal. And um, I love when these deals come up. They don't come up often like that. We get such huge margins and such a big hit like that. But when they do come up, I'm very, very grateful. So, Mark, I got, a question. I got a question for you. Are yeah. you thinking Are you thinking 40000 short term? Are you thinking 40000 Put on the market, hopefully sell in 60 to 90 days. What are your thoughts yeah, on six, that? Yeah, 60 to 90 days. I mean, that, that's, this is a realtor deal. It's 500 feet from power. There's homes all around the area. I mean, this isn't, you know, raw, undeveloped land. This is in the middle of development, and which, you, is why, you, which is why, the you know, the last property that sold, sold for over 40 in that are subdivision. Are you thinking owner financing or no? Yeah. I mean, I'd like to, you know, get half down, so get 100 out and then finance another 100. It's a beautiful deal, my friend. Yeah. Beautiful deal. So, like you know, it. because the margins are so high, I have total flexibility. And, um, I'm, yeah, I'll definitely get my 15 out very quickly. I like it. I yeah. like it a lot. So that's what's going on with me. Um, still selling land. Texas, Arizona, Nevada, Colorado. Colorado's selling fast. Um, yeah. For sure. Nevada's selling pretty quick. Texas, eh, it's not that fast. But selling. Yeah. So, yeah. No, I, I think, uh, I think, you know, it's interesting that we, you know, it, it, it ebbs and flows in terms of interest for certain states, I think. But, uh, Nevada seems like a pretty steady market. Colorado seems like a pretty steady market, which is always nice. I mean, over the years, you know, if you want to, if you want to liquidate property, you can do so in, in those two states. I know that for a fact. Right. Right. Where, where are you looking these days? Are you still sticking to Nevada? What's going on with your project? What's going on with the coal mining or the, uh, the mining, gold mining? Yeah. I don't want to get into too much detail, but uh, we've got some very, very, very promising things happening right now. Uh, we were, we've been, we've been. Anytime you're looking at raising <clears throat> significant capital from an investment bank, it's a, it's a challenge and a process. 
<clears throat> and we're working on kind of a multi-leg deal um, that has taken a little longer than we expected, but um, everything sort of come to head this past week. And uh, we are in um, some heavy negotiations right now, and I'm pretty excited and look to have uh, the financing wrapped up by next week for the project. So we'll be hopefully drilling by either year's end or beginning of Q1 2015. I love it. So not to jinx you, but I did get this question from uh, my coaching student, Adrian, which I thought was a, a great question. No one's really asked me. He's like, what do you do with all your money? How do you allocate it? So let's say, for example, you, you get a seven-figure payday. Mm-hmm. on your mining hit, right? Mm-hmm. And I make 200 grand or whatever it is. What percentage of that goes back into the business? Okay. What percentage of that do you save for taxes? What percentage of that do you then maybe diversify into other investments? And how do you handle that as far as cash allocation? Uh, in, in, a, in a situation like that, the, the mining project, which would be uh, a fairly significant number for me, um, on an exit now, so it's it's a little different now because we're actually just taking investment in, uh, so it wouldn't it wouldn't necessarily be a a, a bigger paycheck to me initially, but it, but it will uh, you know a couple years down the line. But in a, in a situation like that, I I would first put aside what I believe to be the you know the tax ramifications of that sale um, in an account and just don't touch the money, um, you know, and then you know sit down with my tax attorney and my my CPAs and discuss you know how to pay that money back to the IRS. Um, and some strategies there. And then um, in terms of, you know, the way I would spend it, the way you would spend it, Mark, we're a little different because I have a couple of, uh, you know, businesses that are currently running. Um, but but all things right now are sort of focused on real estate. So I would probably put, um, you know, I would probably put 10 to 15% back into my land business. Um, and then I would I would probably diversify a little bit into some some businesses, um, you know, that I'm, that I'm currently invested in now. And, uh, and then, of course, keep some cash on hand. is Because, you know, you always want to have a good chunk of change for, for that deal when it comes along. I mean, uh, you know, the, it's always nice to, to not use your own capital. Um, right. But if there's, a, if there's a deal that needs to close in 24 hours and you've got the cash, it's nice to have in the bank. You know, it's so funny because that's pretty much the same type of answer I gave Adrian. The pro- See, this is the problem with our business. We can't find a better investment, right? Yeah. Yeah. You just can't. You can't get a higher return anywhere else than land. If we're making 300% to 1,000%, let's just say worst case scenario, we're making 100%. Where else do you get those returns? Honestly. Yep. I agree. I agree. I mean, I, I guess saw- I guess if you, if you, you know, got an IPO that was a high-flying IPO, I don't know. Yeah. But yeah, but, that's uh, that, gambling. That's, that's legalized gambling. So Yeah, I mean, so for doing a little bit of extra work and hustling, we make these huge returns. And I was telling Adrian, once you get to $10,000 a month passive, right, that's literally like saving $2.4 million. That's 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 hard to do. Yeah. To save $2.4 million, buy a bond at 4%, and have $10,000 a month coming in passive, that's really tough for most people to do. Yeah, I mean, I, that, I, that could literally take, if you're working a job, that could take a lifetime. Right? Unless, you, unless you worked at Instagram. Or if, yeah, I mean, so if you have, yeah, exactly. So if you have this huge <laughs> exit, then you take your 2.4 million or whatever it is, and you put it into an account. So that's the beauty of this business is the passive income and the notes and, and getting that cash flow in because it's literally like saving millions of dollars. And it yep. doesn't take that long. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree 100. percent I think I think land is probably the safest investment you can make. Of course, you have to do your due diligence, and we've talked about it before. The the cheaper you buy the land, the safer it is in terms of. Again, you just have to know the market. So, if you're spending fifty thousand dollars on a piece of land, really do your due diligence and know what you're buying. Um, you know, if you're buying a, you know, I'm not saying that you don't do your due diligence buying a five thousand dollar piece of land. It's just that, g- generally speaking, um, you know, there's uh, there's a, there's a there's a lot of things you have to uncover on a fifty thousand dollar piece of land because that's a huge risk. You could be sitting on that fifty grand for twenty years if if uh, you buy wrong. Right. Yeah. Exactly. And I'll give you. I'll actually give you for instance or an example. My grand. Well, and it's really interesting. And, uh, and there might be some people interested actually on the podcast listening. My grandfather owns a lake up in uh, Spokane, Washington. It's called Horseshoe Lake. I actually have it um, on my uh, on my website at Reserve Land. And 
I, it's one of the things I've, I've been trying to help him for years market and and uh, it's a gorgeous piece of land it's literally got it's an 80 acre lake it's got uh, 22 subdivided parcels um i think like 15 on the lake and, and there's, there's to sell, power on all those parcels there's power i think to several of them correct okay uh, beautiful beautiful property um he he wanted to sell it as a as a whole piece of land for a while he was he i think he spent about i want to say over over the over time probably five or six hundred grand on that, on that land right. um which is kind of odd, but he's asking i think one one million bucks for it that's it that's it and it, and he can't and he's had a hard time getting it and but i i think at top of the market he turned down a couple offers that were a lot more than that so i think it's kind of in hindsight like in our business mark we look at the margin and go hey if i'm making you know and it's not just margin if i take if i got a million dollar property that i've got under option that i can sell for 1.5 million I'm going to go, hey, that's a good deal. That's a 50% return, um, you know, short term. So for him, I, I, I'm, I think because he had the property for so long he, mentally, and I think it just kind of comes with that, <clears throat> kind of comes with that like old school real estate mentality that I'm just going to hang on. Right. And hang on, hang on and price it. And, and I think because the way the market fluctuates these days a lot different. I mean, people talk about 10 year cycles and, you know, we could talk all day long about, you know, the manipulated cycles of what's going on today and how they're, you know, and I wouldn't say, you know, purposely manipulated, but at some level, I do believe that. But like we talk about mortgage, mortgage backed securities being purchased by the Fed, you know, that that pushes rates down. So in effect, that sort of manipulates the market indirectly. And um, and so it, with this land, he could have sold it and he could have made a huge profit and he decided against it. And, and so he's been sitting for almost 30, oh, no, over 30 years now on this property. And I've been trying to help him. And he's he's in his 80s and, and he just wants to move it. But he's uh. He's getting he's getting a lot of offers now, and I've been helping him market it. But well, yeah, uh, let me ask you: how, how are you marketing that property? Are you using a realtor? Are you doing Facebook? I mean, how how are you doing that? Uh, Facebook, uh, Craigslist, uh, Land and Farm, Land Watch, um, and, and several websites, and just uh, and all the leads that we generate. So he's gotten because they're broken up now. It's a great it's a great term property, right? Right. So he can sell one parcel for. You know, forty to fifty thousand, and then on maybe on the lake, he sells it for eighty grand. But you give you give him five hundred bucks down and seven, six, seven hundred bucks a month, depending on how much the property is. Maybe three hundred bucks a month if it's off the lake. And uh, but there are CCNRs in place, so you have to abide by the you know the rules and regs that are that are um, you know on the property, which I think is like a minimum two thousand square foot house. So if you're going to build, you have to build right. Wait, Drew, but, why don't you just focus on selling to builders, local builders in Spokane? We tried that. We tried that. So it was, it's just been, a, you know, it's, it, it's not in the heart of Spokane. It's about 20 minutes away. Right. But, but I think that the dilemma is there's a lot of property like Spokane. If you got, you know, w you know, look at, if you look at a Spokane auction, there's property everywhere. So now lakefront is a different story. I mean, this is le legitimately lakefront property. So that's interesting because I would think if I was a builder, I could sell lakefront lots custom. Trust me. I've called, I've called probably seven or eight myself and talked to them. So, really, and, and you have to remember. Well, you know, the market was so depressed; nobody wanted to build anything. For a while. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, yeah, and I and I think that's the idea. Like you could, you know, creatively, you could joint venture with it with a uh, a builder and take some risk with the builder, and and uh, you know, hopefully, maybe you know, flip a home. And but again, you're talking about you know, it's really speculative. You're you're 20 minutes outside the city. You know what what are the homes going to sell for? What are building costs? So you look at all those numbers. You know, homes are homes are very speculative. I mean, how many times have people built homes and lost money? So, and that's that's the scary part. Right, right. But historically, they haven't been that speculative. I mean, historically, they they've increased in value what about one percent a year? Is that right? I think on average, I think the average is is three percent a year. Three percent a year, really? Yeah, maybe maybe states, California. I don't Listen, think, uh, no, I think, I think nationally, the, the national appreciation average yearly of real estate is to three percent. Three percent per year. I don't know if you look at the last that that's that's been a thought. That's what's always been talked about, sort of like the ten year cycles. But I do know that that that, that three percent has always sort of been that rule of thumb with with uh, appreciation. So now, of course, if you look at it over the last 12, 12 months in or maybe eighteen months in Southern California. Appreciation's up like twenty five percent, so um, right. that makes right. that that makes that follow down years. Yeah, I mean, you can make an argument we're in almost another housing bubble. We are, we are. It's not an argument. We are in a housing. We bubble. are in a housing bubble. 
There's no it, not it, not nationally though, just pockets. Yeah, no, there are pockets. So the demand, the high demand pockets are definitely, uh, you know, people. I had, I had a long, I had a dinner last night with a, with a couple of people, and we sort of just discussed the market about where where's the market, uh, you know, from single family homes. What what where are we gonna where are we gonna be at in a year from now, two years from now, and and my thought is we are literally at the tipping point of of sustainability. I mean, I don't I don't know how. Like in Southern California, I don't know how people, half these people afford their homes. I don't get it. Um, you know, putting putting two hundred thousand dollars down on a million dollar home and still having a five to six thousand dollar mortgage payment with property taxes, HOA. I mean, these people are. I don't get it. I don't know how many. And there are there are th- tens of thousands of of million dollar homes in San Diego, right. and I don't know. How, and I don't know how people can afford it. I just don't get it. So they're millionaires. But, there, there are people that have very. Or their house poor, or they're exactly, and I think that's kind of we're, we're back to that two thousand and six, two thousand and seven bubble where people people just want it's all about buying the big house and buying the nice fancy cars. We're right back there again, which is sad. But it, the good thing goes to people you know that are in this business of, of buying and selling land. Like Mark and I have never been in that bubble of like uh, we want these amazing homes and these amazing cars. We just wanted to focus on land because we knew that land was a safe investment. Right. Well, you know, the, the problem is, is that we're not going to get a return anywhere else that we're getting on land. And especially when you, when you think about your time. I mean, I did a house flip back in the day, I think in t- 2006, in the very top of the market, made $100,000 on it in carefree. But I was, I was up there every other day yeah. meeting this, the, the subcontractors and watering the plants. And when I factored to my time, it was miserable. Yeah. I could have been doing more land deals. And made probably just as much money. Yeah. No, I think, uh, and in reality, that's the hard part, right? It's the management aspect. It's the contractors. I, I did a flip. Uh, I did a flip about seven, eight years ago, nine years ago, um, of a condo down in San Diego, and uh, it was right next to a, a really, really beautiful school. And uh, and I, I thought, gosh, should we sell the house? Should we flip it? Anyway, we put money and we flipped it, and it was just a nightmare. I mean, the contractors skipped town like three times. You know, I had to bring about. It's just you know, managing. Uh, you know, those type of people can sometimes be a challenge. And I'm not a construction guy. Do you know construction at all? I do a little bit. You do. See, I don't know it at all. And um, you know, these these contractors could have done the worst work ever, and I wouldn't know. I wouldn't know if it was shoddy. I wouldn't know if it was good. You know, at, at that point, because I wasn't flipping it, I was just looking at okay, what's the cheapest price I can get to get these cabinets refaced. Or you know this low ceil- you know ceiling yeah. fan, and just kind of updating it. Yeah. Now it worked, but at the end of the day, to do that huh, continually would just be miserable. Yeah, you know I think one of the interesting things about that is I like we've talked before. I love educating myself on these these type of situations, right? Like I want to know more about contracting and how they do their job, so that I can sort of manage them and I don't want to micromanage them but I want to go in and manage the process and know hey that's a that's a really bad job or you need to fix that or you need to change that right. because because those are things that they'll come up along you know several times in your life um, whether you like it or not so it's good just to know that stuff so I've always sort of been in I've installed hardwood floors I've done a lot of different things just to for nothing more than just to learn that's so, great that's so, great yeah I'm, I'm always afraid it's going to cost like me twice as much you don't look like a guy that likes to put in hardwood floors, though. No, I'm, just, I'm definitely not. I pay. I pay for everything. I pay know, for everything, Duran. I do nothing myself. Wow, I like it. Yeah, but that's where my you know, where's my time more valuable? Right, right, right here on camera, land. Geek. Right, yeah, right, yeah, exactly. Land geek and, and land investing. I'm exactly. losing money installing hardwood floors. Yeah, exactly. You know. So. Um, yeah, that's it, again. We, you know, going back, going back to what you said earlier. Just land, land is a very, very safe investment, and uh, well, you know, it's, and, it's safe the way that we do it. Yeah, the, the outside world looks at land and says, "Oh, that's highly speculative, and that's a terrible asset class. It's only for the most professional of investors," which is totally untrue. Which is well, exactly. I mean, not not the way that we do it. Yeah, but you can, you can be professional by going through your program pretty quickly and understanding just. Just the basic aspects of due diligence. Right, right. But, you know, typically when people think of land investing, they think of going vertical, going through the entitlement process, planning out a subdivision, selling it to a builder, talking about, you know, putting an infrastructure, doing phase one, phase two environmental, 
And that is not what we're doing. Yeah, there, there's a there's a four there's four words that I like to share with people. Don't be a developer. That yeah, is yeah, eighty percent of developers go under, right? Yeah, it's it's a very very chat now. Granted, there are times when development's good, right? My mining project, we're developing this project, um, but it's but it's such it's such a different type of of business that it it makes things very challenging, and it's there's a lot of risk involved. Tons of risk, tons so. and tons of risk. Most developers run out of money. Yep. I mean, um, just the, the, the permitting process alone, like going to a local county and try, because you're not going to know everyone and how to get things done. So it's 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 always going to be a challenge because uh, you know the powers that be in the counties they sort of control what you do, and if they don't want it there, it's not going to be there. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. You do you ever get the uh, you ever you ever get the grass is greener syndrome? And you look at what other people are doing and think, oh, maybe I should be doing that instead. That looks that looks more lucrative. That looks more fun. Uh, you only ever, when you ever, I, you ever get only, that? Only when I'm I've got 19 projects that I'm managing and realize that focusing on one could be a lot more lucrative than 19. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Who was who was I? I was talking to somebody about you. I'm like, yeah, Duran's got business ADD. You're you're in everything. Yeah, you, you know what? You're right. And I think, but but here's the here's the really cool part is like you. A lot of the things that I'm involved with I do, aren't aren't things that take my my time. They're not day to day things that I need to be involved with. You know, like certain aspects of the magazine. Uh, you know, which I don't talk about very often. But it's a really cool magazine that's doing very well. I've been involved in several aspects of the process, but I'll spend an hour or two here and there. I'll write an article for the magazine. I'll call up a few people. I've I've got contacts that are in the the industry that I can you know chat about some national advertising campaigns for the magazine. Like just different things that like I sort of use my network to kind of help. And and it, that goes you know that goes for the surf company that I'm invested in. That goes for the headphone company I'm invested in. It goes for a couple of software companies I'm invested in. So a lot of the things that I do, I'm not the CEO. Um, I I'm basically an advisor helping build that brand by my network and connection. So yeah, it sounds like I've got a lot going on. The mining project, I've got my, you know, I am I am spending a lot of time on and I have over the years. Um, you know, and it's it's a it's a risky project, but there's a big reward at the end of the tunnel if I can if I, and no pun intended tunnel, but if I <laughs> if I can get there. So Right. Yeah, that's yeah, that's interesting. I mean, but when you go to bed at night, do you ever feel like, "Oh my gosh, there were ten things on my to-do list that I wanted to get done and I couldn't get done. You ever feel? You ever feel like there's just you've so much on your plate. You have so many different areas of focus. Do you ever feel like that? Um, like you didn't get enough done. A- occasionally, I do, but for the most part, I, again, I because I'm so structured and regimented with what I do on a daily basis. I think that I've got myself in a position where I, I I'll push things off my plate. Like if if things are moving too slow or or you know, like there, you know, something very big, you know, fell on my lap a couple of weeks ago um, here locally in San Diego, and a couple of you know, business, big businessmen that I ran into with with some deep pockets came and asked me to help on a big project, and it's a, it's a, it's a probably a two hundred million dollar project um, that could be something very. Now, when I say two hundred million, not for me, right. but if for the city of San Diego or for the county of San Diego, it could be. And, um, and, and it's a game changer, but do I want to take my time and focus on that entirely? No, because it takes away from what I'm currently making money, but it's something that, it, and, I, and I have to assess the project, right? Is that if I assess the project, is, is it something that I, is it something I can see myself spending three or four hours a day on for the next month and a half or two months or five months to make this thing come to fruition? Does that yeah. make sense? But I don't, I don't ever feel like I, I, I don't ever go to bed going, gosh, I forgot to do this or that. Cause I'm very like my, my inbox is clean every single day. No, it's not. I promise you, Mark. Duran, how's that possible? Dude, it's. I'll, I should send you a snapshot. It's clean every day, Mark. So, I you know what? I want to see that snapshot. I'm going to put it on my website. Okay. You don't okay. do it right now. Okay. Don't, I'll, don't, I'll, don't multitask. Uh, dude, I'm not. We, we, I, we, we, we just did a coffee talk on that. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, well, I think we're about that time, Mark. I know you've got something very special for the listeners. So, why don't you go ahead and tell me what is your tip of the week? How many times do we have to go over this? How many times do we have to talk about this? What's the problem? It's the Land Geek Podcast. 
You oh. are my guest. I put you on the spot. And I oh, say, Duran, we're at that time. What's your tip of the week? Now I you're now you're now you're being me. I thought this was a land freak website. Yeah. Or you, that's that's what you call me off air. No, I'm the land freak, you're the land geek. Oh, that's right, land freak. Yeah. <laughs> you're, you're like the doppelganger. You should set the land freak podcast that competes with the land geek podcast. Oh, it's funny. Come that's on, funny. man. What, what's your tip of the week? Uh, my tip of the week is a, a wonderful little website. It's called swiftly.com. I've, S- heard, I've heard of that. Let me check it out. S W I F T L Y.com. Swiftly is basically a spinoff from a company that we've talked about in the past called 99designs.com. And basically, I think you can get stuff done in like a couple, like 30 minutes is the average turnaround. So if you need changes, and, and the average cost is, I think it's 19 bucks to do it. So photo retouching, logo changes, business card changes, vectorization, banner ad updates, uh, and a lot of other things, um, all can be done on swiftly.com. Oh, this and, is great. Well, well, let me ask you, is this better than Fiverr? You know what? It's a little bit more advanced than Fiverr. Um, what, what you're, you're dealing with, with people that are real graphic designers. Fiverr, there are a couple of ones that are, and they'll have the, you know, the add-on packages that you pay 10 or 15 or 20 bucks more, and that's who you're dealing with here. So you're dealing with kind of like, these are, the, these are like the add-on packages at Fiverr, if that makes sense. Okay, so well, let me ask you, you know, for 19 bucks, they say they do it in less than an hour. You yeah. can request revisions until you're completely happy with the work. Then do they charge you more? No. Huh. Interesting. I wonder uh, if I wonder if they'll help with uh, with landing pages. If I if I have the copy, would they would they go in and make it look better? Sure. For, well, 19, here, for nineteen bucks, possibly. So check this out for for twenty five tasks for twenty five tasks. You can pay two seventy five. That's only eleven dollars a task. So if you go, yeah, to- but, yeah but how, what would you do with this? Update your Facebook cover photo. Well, I mean, your logo, business all cards, of, all sorts. Of, I'm just saying you can buy in bulk too, which is pretty cool. That is cool. So you can buy like you know you can you know five tasks are sixteen bucks a task, ten tasks are uh, you know fourteen bucks a task. But again, it's it's kind of like a fiber on steroids a little bit. This is cool. Great tip. You're you're on fire with your Thanks, tips. Dude. You better okay. have a good one. For me. I, I, I'm, I'm going to have a good one. Mine is, I'm really enjoying this uh, this new 18 Minutes to Focus uh, book that I'm reading and implementing into my life and and you having these five areas of focus for the year and then having to-do lists and putting them on my calendar. But one of the ways that I'm making to-do lists is I'm using an app and it's also a web app and it's free. It's wonderlist.com and I'll spell that for you. W U, not W O, like the bread. W U N D E R L I S T dot com. Check it out. Wonderlist.com. It syncs among all your devices and it's free and it's great. I, I'm I'm really enjoying it. And then I make my my for my to do list, I have my five areas of focus and I have to do's for each part of the focus. And then I just put those things in my calendar in the morning and it keeps me focused and energized throughout the day. So at the end of the day, I feel like, oh, I got a lot done, and I had really good control of my calendar. You know what, Mark? I, I'm just going to say this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to – I have to break it out there for all the listeners. Mark actually brought this up on, like, podcast number 10. I don't know what – I didn't bring up Wonderlist. Yes, you did. No, I, I didn't. I, I was productive. You know. <laughs> <laughs> it's similar. Now you're, now you're French on me? Come on, dude. I'm just trying to tell you that you've definitely brought this up before. I've heard it. Wonderlist? Yeah, you you need to step it up a little bit because I've been here giving these listeners something really good to go play with, and you give them wonder. I mean, come on, really? come on. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm just kidding. No, this isn't bad. I actually, I actually like it. It's you're really you're cool. so graphic. You know what we had? Graphic River, and now Swiftly. Come on, man. You know what? Next week I've got a great due diligence tip. I'm not telling you. Listen, everybody, listen to the podcast next week because I've got an amazing due diligence tip. But I'm not going to give it out yet because I still have to test it. But um, it's something that might be able to replace uh, my other due diligence uh, site that we use. So if you want more tips, tricks, techniques on how to make an incredible income actively and passively, buying and selling raw land, 
please visit www.thelandgeek.com, download the Passive Income Blueprint, get the ebook, How to Avoid the Three Fatal Land Buying Mistakes, and of course, get this amazing, engaging, informative podcast delivered each week to your email inbox. And if you want to acquire some wholesale land, check out reserveland.com. If Duran doesn't have anything you want, check out frontierpropertiesusa.com. Subscribe to my VIP list. Get some shekels off your first piece of property. And, uh, of course, visit landhub.com. So, Duran, are we good? Anything else you want to discuss before we, we close? No, I think uh, we, we got it. We had a pretty, you know, we didn't really argue too much today, which kind of bums me out. We can argue if you want about something. We'll do it off. We'll do it offline. Offline. Hey, okay. I, you know what? Thanks, everybody, for listening. Duran, I really appreciate you taking time out of your extremely hectic, busy, crazy, chaotic schedule. Um, thanks, Mark. Thanks, buddy. So we'll see everybody next week. Have a good one. Thank you for listening to another episode of The Land Geek. Join us next time for more tips, secrets, and information that will help you succeed. Stay connected with The Land Geek on Facebook at facebook.com slash thelandgeek.